Okay, so to begin this tour, we need to understand what the life was like in Chelmsford before Springfield Lions Bronze Age enclosure. So to give you an idea, around 4,000 BC, so about 3,000 years before the enclosure, farming was being introduced into Britain uh, from the Middle East, and this land was being domesticated for the very first time. And as a result, Neolithic people or New Stone Age people were starting to claim ownership over the land for the very first time. Uh, and the first expression of this would have been roughly visible over this landscape, which was the Springfield Cursus. So it was a basically a long parallel set of ditches terminating at each end, one end of it which is under the Asda car park and the other end is under the Chelmsford Village retail park. And basically on one end there was a long barrow, like a chambered tomb used for housing the dead, and on the other hand was a very peculiar set of ringed wooden posts not unlike a wooden Stonehenge in miniature. No one knows what this cursus was for, no, no one knows what any cursus was for, uh, but it may have been used for rituals, maybe a rite of passage, walking along this processional parallel row of ditches. Uh, maybe it was uh, some, like, to symbolise uh, adolescence to adulthood. No one really knows. But what we do know is that it was one of the first expressions of identity within the landscape of Trumpsford as we know it. And uh, it, it, it then paved the way for further expressions as we will discover together. Okay, so if you picture this landscape over here, like remove all the trees, all the earth, and uh, about 4000 BC in the Neolithic period, all of this would have been a flat landscape overlooking the Chelmer. And you can just imagine in the Ice Age, uh, even earlier than that, or even in the Neolithic, when this was prone to flooding, uh, all of the frozen water would be glistening. And it's, it's hard not to imagine that the Neolithic people of, of this area would have considered it a, almost a sacred place, uh, just overlooking here. And, and actually, this, this sort of landscape positioning um, leads us to this, the next uh, bit in structure in the site's history, which was the Neolithic enclosure. So constructed around the same time as the Cursus, uh, this was a causeway enclosure, uh, not unlike the Bronze Age one, but with a very different purpose. So this one wasn't actually uh, occupied, wasn't used as a home or in any sort of way. All we know is that there was some sort of axe head deposited in the ditch, and uh, it was positioned between two streams. So if you can see the landscape here, it would have been curving round uh, and would have been a prominent feature in the landscape. Again, we don't know why it was used, not for sure anyway, but it was probably used for rituals, maybe a meeting place for exchanging goods. Uh, but all we know is that it's, it's not visible anymore, apart from the crop marks 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. And all we have to remember it by is the archaeological evidence. Uh, but that leads us again into another period of occupation with the Bronze Age enclosure. And as you know, that is very much visible. So here marks the beginning of the Bronze Age story. So behind you now would have been the Neolithic enclosure, and over here is the Bronze Age enclosure. So it's, it's no accident that both of the enclosures are aligned together. It seems that uh, during the Bronze Age, which was about 850 BC, very late Bronze Age, the Neolithic enclosure would have still been visible. And this is important because it seems to have been some sort of respect or connection to the ancestors before it. But the difference with this one is that it was domesticated. So, circular pattern around here would have been six stitches and six causeways. And uh, as you can see, it's quite deep down here and it would have been even deeper during the Bronze Age. And uh, we would have found this in 1981 uh, from aerial crop marks. So here we are in the main eastern entrance of the Bronze Age enclosure. So this is one of six entrances into it. So when you're thinking, was it a, de a defensive enclosure? The answer is probably not, because if you build a, an enclosure to defend against something, you don't build six entrances into it. So it seems to have been, although a really important settlement, it was mainly for show that they had so many entrances. And as you can see above here, about 850 BC, when this was in use, would have been a very substantial gatehouse made of completely of wood. And they originally thought that the enclosure was surrounded by some sort of earthen rampart, uh, but they now believe that it was actually uh, a really substantial timber wall or fence around the enclosure. Now, it would have been a really astonishing amount of manpower to build or chop the wood and construct this fence. So, it does beg the question, who built this place and 
was this person who lived here really extremely important? And the answer is probably. So where we're standing now would have been the central roundhouse in the Bronze Age enclosure. So there would have been three roundhouses. This one would have been the central main roundhouse. Its porch would have been aligned with the eastern entrance where we've just been. And I think that's really important because one, you would have been able to see the Neolithic enclosure and all of the associated monuments in the landscape. And also there, there seems to be some sort of obsession with the east and the rising sun associated with fertility and that sort of thing in prehistory. And so it would have been really imposing, not just for the guests to come into the enclosure and see this porch and the person who lived here, but also to see the rising sun bask on the people's faces. And uh, it's, it's really important that people lived here uh, and because it, it, it's really symbolized in the landscape from what we found. So we found three roundhouses, thatched conical roofs, probably. Uh, we found evidence of hazelnuts, wheat, beans, seeds, uh, what you generally see from domestication and, and, and domestic use. And based on the substantial uh, timber fence, the prominence in the landscape, the association with the other monuments, it seems very probable that this would have been the home of a, like a local chief sometime in the late Bronze Age, the centuries either side of 850 BC. Okay, so, so far we know that the Bronze Age enclosure was a place of domestic use, but that's not the full story. So, in one of these ditches here, this is the western entrance, uh, aligned with the eastern entrance. When they were doing the excavations in 1981, they found something extraordinary. And these were clay moulds used for making swords. And that's actually the largest amount of clay moulds found from any Bronze Age site in Britain. So what they would have done would have been to pour molten metal, molten bronze, into these moulds, uh, break them open, and we have some swords. And this is really, really unusual for a Bronze Age site, considering generally the Bronze Age was a non-violent place. Perhaps this was to symbolise that Springfield Lions was a really important place. That the, the, the very creation of swords and the and the, the moulds being placed into the ditches in an almost ritual fashion does suggest that it was some sort of power play, symbolising how important the the leaders here were to the wider community, and the fact that it was these they were found in the ditch here and also in the eastern ditch. It's no coincidence. There was some sort of deliberate positioning. Was it a foundation stone? Was it to give thanks to the earth for the materials used to make swords? Who knows? But that's what I think makes the enclosure stand out from other prehistoric features around the country. Now we're entering the final stage of the Bronze Age enclosures place in this site. So basically around 850 BC, a few years after that, it became gradually out of use as a domestic settlement. But that did not mean that the Bronze Age enclosure became useless. So during the Iron Age, which began about 700 BC, there was some sort of ritual ceremony happening here because they found an Iron Age sword of really fine craftsmanship deposited in one of these ditches. Now, you all know about the legend of King Arthur and the Lady in the Lake and the Sword in the Stone and the idea of taking a sword or some sort of object and taking it out of the human world into water or earth or something like that. And it's not beyond the realms of imagination to think that it happened here as, as, and con continued to be a sacred place. And so the Romans were here as well, a few years after that we found Roman bricks in here and the enclosure seems to have been generally undisturbed. So it seems that it was some sort of um, respected place even as it went out of use as a Bronze Age site. So we need to now fast forward about 800 years into the future, so this is after 850 BC, we're now in around 500, 600 AD. So this is behind the Bronze Age enclosure, around here, all the lumps and bumps that you can see, the little indentations in the ground, uh, would have been an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. Uh, quite an early one as well, which is quite unusual. This would have been around the same time as the Sutton Hoo Cemetery in Suffolk. So uh, all sorts of different kinds of rites and rituals were involved in the people buried here. So around 250 burials were here, about half were buried, as uh, inhumations and around half were cremations uh, and as that uh, that initially suggests that it was some sort of 
division between religious rites. And to give you a flavour of what that was like, uh, we actually found a horse's head buried in one of these ditches as well. Probably a sacrifice, uh, suggesting a throwback to the pagan beliefs of the prehistoric ancestors here. But as you can see, this would have been a sentimental, sacred place linked to the cemetery. And the fact that most of the burials were outside of the enclosure uh, suggests that it was connected to the site and respected as well. So it's, it's just one more chapter in the age of Springfield Lions. So this is the final chapter in this immediate site over here. So behind you is the Bronze Age enclosure and also the Anglo-Saxon Cemetery. So we're going to jump even further into the future now. So about 800, 900 AD. So this is right into the thick of the Anglo-Saxon period. And what actually happened here in this landscape would be an Anglo-Saxon settlement. So they, they believe there was quite a few buildings here, uh, like some sort of main hall maybe, some sort of timber hall, a barn, maybe a windmill was here, and some sort of bell tower as well. Uh, but that's, this, is, this is what would have been some sort of settlement which cropped up alongside and after the, set, the, the cemetery. And uh, immediately over there is the modern day Kewton Hall. Some of you may be familiar with it. And what we believe was happening here was the original Kewton Hall. So if you translate Kewton, it's an actually an old English word meaning Kufa's Tun, which is so the, uh, an Anglo-Saxon lord called Kufa, C-Y-F-E-R, and Tun, actually means, incredibly, enclosure. So it's Kufa's enclosure. And the fact that no enclosure has been found in the Anglo-Saxon settlement suggests that the Bronze Age enclosure was visible at this time and may have been derived into a name that we recognize today. But that's the immediate and uh, ultimate legacy of what would have been a settlement here and the Bronze Age enclosure enduring through the ages. So what you see before you is uh, the final destination in our tour. So we're jumping right forward now from Anglo-Saxons to the Second World War. So this is one of the Second World War pillboxes. So towards the end of the war, uh, Britain was very worried about a Nazi invasion. So worried, in fact, that they created a series of defences. Now, one of the most devastating defences to the Bronze Age enclosure was actually inside it. It was a bisecting anti-tank trap through the enclosure. It's now invisible and it didn't do too much damage because uh, the Bronze Age enclosure is with us today. Uh, but what is here still for all of us to see is one of the uh, pillboxes. And it would have been made of, uh, of, of cement and uh, would have been ha hastily uh, constructed right along the eastern coast, up from Edinburgh down to C uh, Canvey Island. And this is one of them uh, which is protecting strategic points, which would have been Chelmsford, London, the River Chelmer those sort of things. And someone would have been sitting here, one of the soldiers, and uh, preparing for uh, artillery, tanks, all sorts of aircraft uh, from the Nazis. And I think it's quite fitting that this is in the landscape now because it's all about boundaries, I think, this site. From the Bronze Age, it might not be a defensive boundary, but it was certainly a boundary in itself with the ditches and the Neolithic enclosure, and certainly the Cursus with its ditches of its own. So uh, this is a, quite a fitting place to finish the tour more than 2,000 years, nearly 3,000, 4,000 years of history, right here at Springfield Lions.